Um, I, I've been looking forward to shifting our focus for a while. We've done really a pretty extensive period of time on the difficult aspects of um, inventory by going through the precepts and then the and before that the uh, hindrances. But I have a couple of great uh, lists that we're going to dig into over the coming probably weeks. I hope it'll take a couple of weeks at least to get through all this. Um, the uh, the ten uh, perfections uh, or paramitas and the seven awakening factors. So that gives us like 17 things to do. <laughs> that could get us to Christmas if we spend enough time on each one, but uh, probably not uh, that much time. But, but I do want to, um, yeah, uh, work, with, work with the idea of positive inventory and not just inventory, but the cultivation of qualities. So not just seeing whether the qualities are there, but also working at developing and cultivating qualities. And, um, you know, I, I think that this tonight might be sort of more of an introduction to this, but I want to talk about something that I've been thinking about today because I was working with it in my meditation and um, it's, a, it's a, another th one of these things that it's a little bit difficult to talk about uh, because it's just a felt experience. Uh, but it has to do with cultivating positive feelings within your body as you're meditating. And, and so it, you know, there, there are various kind of terms for these positive feelings and I mean everything from well you know mostly we talk about those feelings in emotional terms or psychological terms so we kind of define them as being somehow um, having having some sort of meaning uh, or um, that they you know that it's something like joy or it's sadness and but when we get into the just uh, subjective experience of these things, these things we call moods or emotions, when we strip away the labels and the preconceptions and our conditioning around them, very often they can be just experienced as f energies or just sensations. F feelings, you know, is even more vague. But I, I like the term energy because it it speaks to the dynamic quality, that these are not static things. It, like, I'm in this mood. It's here. It's a solid thing. They're not that at all. A and I relate this, uh, you know, many of you were, at least some of you were on the retreat with, with Greg, and many of you, uh, some of you who weren't on that retreat have been on retreats with him or have done Qigong in various ways, but this really relates to Qigong as well. And, and I like that, that in some ways, Qi isn't really defined very much. You know, it's kind of just defined as energy or life force or life energy. And we see how we can kind of connect with this subtle feelings of energy in the body and that with subtle movements, we can sort of see how that energy moves. We can have a sense of it moving. Um, and, you know, th that all depends on how connected you get with that practice. But we can start to do this same thing in our meditation, that we can start to move energy in our body in meditation w with very, with intentionality, of, you know, m move it with a, particular purpose. And, and, you know, before going further with that, I want to say this is something we have to be very careful with, because it can easily verge into grasping. You know, once we start to play with energy and see, oh, I can like do this. Well, let me see if I can get that going. And then, you know, I'm in a bad mood. Well, let me see if I can, you know, 
jam some good energy into my mood, you know. So we have to be very careful with it. It has to be done with this kind of very open, kind of um, a sense of kind of welcoming or allowing rather than, you know, pumping it up. So the and 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 there's a, can be a sense of discovering is there energy is there any kind of positive energy or sensation or feeling in my body and and where might that be and can i can i kind of build that um this relates as well to a whole other teaching on the on the concentration practice called jhanas and at some point in these coming weeks uh i will explore that somewhat it's another area that's that's tricky and and requires sort of a maturity around our practice um but uh, just to bring it back to like uh, just to say like for myself this morning you know i was feeling ah oh, like I'm, you know so hard to keep our mood up right now and instead of trying to do something cognitive um you know, trying to think my way out of it or kind of change perspective or even like, well, let me think about loving kindness or something, you know, which is still cognitive. I just started to work with like, just move energy through my body and, and just imagining that there is some kind of positive energy. And you can, you know, if you want to think of it, you know, as a chemical, you know, oxytocin or something, you know, maybe, but to just kind of like, can I just move that? Can I arouse that? And it, and it really, uh, it was very effective for me today. And I, obviously it's not the first time I've done that, but um, it, it just kind of like, oh, just kind of smooth. It's not like, okay, everything's great now, but it's just sort of enough to kind of lift me out of that kind of just dull place, like I'm meditating now. All right, I'll put in my hour or my half hour or whatever. Okay, breathing in, breathing out, blah, blah. You know, uh, that sort of when the energy, physical, and em when the emotional energy is down, the physical energy gets down. And it can, you know, you can really get into a very dull place with your meditation. And it's not particularly productive. Uh, in fact, it's not recommended that people med meditation isn't really recommended when you are in a deep depression like to try because the depression energetically suppresses you so much that it's hard to uh, have any clarity. Uh, so that's just kind of an introduction. I, uh, I don't know that I hesitate a little bit to try to do a guided meditation around this uh, because uh, there's, I don't like so much the idea, okay, of trying to manipulate people into feeling something in particular. But I, I want you to, I, I just want to put that out to you as something to experiment in the coming days to see if you can sort of just, it's, you're not, not thinking about it, you're not trying to make something happen, but you're just sort of like, can energy, like, can I find positive, pleasant energy in myself? Uh, and just uh, sort of guide my body into that space. So uh, let, let's meditate and, and maybe I'll do a little bit of that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't always, I don't usually know where I'm going to go guiding meditation. So, settling into the body. And you want to be sitting upright. And again, as this relates to energy, if we're slumped or we're sort of sunken into a, a deep couch, um, the energy is going to tend to sink. Now, sometimes when when we're agitated, when there's a lot of anxious energy, that's what we want to do is sink the energy in, you know, lower a little bit. But if the energy is down, it definitely is helpful to keep the posture upright. So 
So there's kind of a brightness in the mind and body. You can close your eyes or just lower your gaze if you're more comfortable like that. So beginning by noticing any areas of tension or discomfort in the body, seeing if you can soften areas of tension, soften around any discomfort. So this is an intentional settling practice. And you might take some time to just move the attention through the body. See if you can feel the sensations in your body as energies. And that what characterizes them as energies is the way that they are not static, that they are in movement. So what we're feeling really is the communication between the sense receptors in the body, the nervous system, the brain. So that communication is a transmission of energy moving back and forth constantly. So as we tune in to the subtle sensations of body, we can start to feel the body, not so much as these sort of solid elements, but more as a field of energy. You know, the breath is the most obvious form of energy that we take in. And then we let out that which the body can't use. Well, the oxygen is putting energy into the body. You might say the exhalation is the exhaust from that engine. Now the breath gives us something steady to focus on, to feel, to sense. Thoughts tend to dominate our attention. And 
they create a kind of veil of separation between our sense experience and our awareness. So that much of the time we're not very aware of what we're experiencing through our senses, only as much as we need in order to function. Of course, our eyes are our dominant sense. So when we close the eyes, it's simpler to just pay attention to the touch sensation, sound sensation, smells, tastes. Besides just the very obvious element of thoughts, words and images that appear in the mind. The other thing that keeps us at a distance from reality, from the direct experience of our lives is our conditioned perception, the, the way we understand things, the way we name things. And this is particularly relevant around our moods. When we name certain feelings as being a particular mood, we actually lose touch with the experience itself. And that tends to reinforce that mood by solidifying it in our minds. Whereas if we feel mood just on this level of sense of touch, feeling without a label, without a memory, to connect it with without a judgment or fear, with no attachment, then it just becomes energy or feeling moving through the body. Then as we let go of labeling and all the thoughts around the experience, the mind is able to approach this quieter place, this quiet place that it longs for, that we all long for, that always seems to be at such a distance out of our reach, even though it's always right here.
meditation can be turned into something exotic, something religious, or into a ritual. But at its fundamental core, it is just being aware of life. Just feeling what it is to be alive.
I think it's going to feel weird when we're able to like be together and meditate together again. Like, have we gotten so used to this? It's like, oh, it's normal. Uh, I, you know, before I go further, I want to see if there are questions about what I was talking about at the beginning of the of the class, I guess I call this. Okay, I gave you a chance. Um, yeah, Deb. I do have a question. Sorry for yeah. the delay. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it takes a while anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, when you were speaking earlier, um, of course, it's very enticing. And before you even um, mention the jhanas, that's where my mind was at uh, because in practice in my exploration and experience with um, meditations, um, that whole concept is very elusive. And like you said, it is, it isn't, I, I believe that the states of um, sensation or feeling or arriving or whatever that is, the oneness with all things possibly, or um, is in just, describable with words mm -hmm. because it's not a word experience and i think that's why it feels so elusive to me um so mm -hmm. is what you were talking about kind of related to those various you know those jhana states yeah yeah and and this is where like just you know i was talking about how we're conditioned to like label things and name them and and how one of the things that winds up doing is creating kind of separation between things like this is this and this is that and there's nothing they're not connected in any way and whereas so for people who aren't aware don't have any idea what we're talking about jhana is a is a word for these concentration states they are kind of altered states that can be very useful. They take they take a lot of practice to arrive at. They take, you know, at least weeks of of silent retreat, if not months, before you can kind of get to them in the uh, deeper ways. But the thing is that the the elements of the jhanas are energies, <laughs> okay? And so the the uh, uh, many of the elements, not all of them, but the but the element of PT, which is called translated as joy or rapture is absolutely energy. And so you don't have to be in the jhanas in order to, to have like, um, you know, a flavor or, or a taste of these energies. And, and yeah, in order to get into a jhana, you, you're, you have to have this deeper concentration that allows you to kind of get over the hump and into this quieter place but that energy of pt and the energy of tranquility and the energy of equanimity which are three of the main energies elements of the jhanas are absolutely part of our lived experience and they're they they are part of our meditative experience it's just that it, they in the jhanas they are developed to a deeper degree and they and they are combined with a, a deeper level of concentration that that um you know isn't um so accessible like as i say it takes time but those energies can be aroused just like mindfulness can be aroused you know you can kind of pump yourself up right and it's sort of this this uh, that's that kind of that energy of pt or joy or rapture is 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 there like people you know, when you, people go to a sports, you know, to a football game or something and they're, yeah, they're all, that's, that's PT, right? It's, it's not that ener it, the energy isn't being directed in this way that we do in meditation. So it doesn't have the same uh, wholesome quality, we would say, you know, in, in Buddhist terms, because there's clinging involved and there's, you know, all that stuff. But, 
but so we see that it's like, oh, I get excited, right? So can I just like arouse that kind of ex feeling of excitement, but in a in a meditative way or in a kind of positive, uh, in, kind of um, inclining it towards just arousing a positive state, not trying to accomplish anything, but just to kind of, it's almost to me like clear out the cobwebs or, you know, just, uh, um, what's the other thing we do um, that people do when they're, <laughs> And they're just, you know, fasting and they're detox. That's what I mean. It's kind of like a detox. And, and, and again, it's not something you can like, you know, just do it all the time. And you're just always going to be like, I'm so clean and happy and detoxed. But like, you know, there are times when it's like, oh, I could, I need a little boost here. And instead of like trying to like be a good meditator, maybe I need to just sort of like, Ooh, just brighten up and you know it's this we're we're in such a heavy time you know it is such, i mean life is hard anyway we've dukkha is the first noble truth but then you throw in you know just the world that we're in right now which is just so so challenging and so sometimes you just have to like move the energy so yes it's related to the jhanas to answer your question thank you deb Um, so I, th I think to, um, to kind of get us started on this, on this work, a work this, over these coming sessions, I'll go back to one breath at a time and, and some of the things that I said in here. And, and so this is section in step four is called positive inventory. It starts the Thich Nhat Hanh who was a Vietnamese Zen teacher. Thich Nhat Hanh encourages us to look closely at suffering, to see the pain in our lives and the pain of others. He also says that suffering is not enough. It's a great phrase. We can't spend our lives focused solely on the first noble truth of suffering because we will lapse into despair. Instead, he said, we must find joy in our lives here and now in this spirit, I find it helpful to make an inventory of my own qual positive qualities and actions, as well as the negative ones. The self-hatred that results in alcoholism can also make inventory a difficult process. There have been times when I have found my inventory to arouse more self-hatred rather than diffusing it. So be careful. It doesn't help to use self-examination as another way to criticize yourself. Positive inventory too can be difficult. Ajahn Tanasanti, a Theravada nun, tells us about one of her students who was taking care of the monks and nuns on the rains retreat at her monastery. I asked her to do some planting on the grounds and she was delighted to have that job. Before she started though, I told her, every time you plant a tree, think of one of your virtues. A look of anguish on her face was as if I'd asked her to clean the outhouses with her bare hands. So though an inventory of our failings may be difficult, an inventory of our virtues may be impossible. This may be a cultural quality of Westerners. Asian teachers are generally dumbfounded by the concept of low self-esteem. Many cultures find self-appreciation to be quite natural and normal. Some years ago, I played in a band with a brilliant Nigerian musician, Lofty Amau. When he introduced one of his songs, he would often say, here's a beautiful song I wrote. The rest of us in the band, we were all Americans, would cringe. How can he be so conceited? Then after meeting one of Lofty's West African friends, we began to see that they all talk like this. It was an accepted practice in their culture. In fact, the Buddha instructed his monks to take pleasure in their skillful actions, to enjoy knowing that what they were doing would bear the fruits of good karma. So I, I, I want to just uh, observe that there's been a shift here. This is typical of my writing and uh, 
you know, it's it's not my fault, man. I need a better editor. All right, it's my fault. Uh, I tend to kind of go off and change where I'm going without realizing that I'm doing that because I start out by talking about doing an inventory of our qualities, but now I'm talking about our inventory of our actions. And those are two different things. <laughs> um, and I think it's easier maybe to, to be positive about our uh, actions than it is about our, you know, our qualities. Uh, anyway, I'll read some more. Uh, in fact, the Buddha instructed his monks to take pleasure in their skillful actions, to enjoy knowing what, that what they were doing would bear the fruits of good karma. I try to practice, the, practice this in simple ways. When I give my spare change to a homeless person, I smile and engage him or her, allowing this tiny act of generosity to bring us both pleasure. There's the pleasure of giving and the pleasure of knowing that the giving is a good thing to do. When I taught meditation at a local rehab for homeless addicts, I would always come out feeling buoyant just from the pleasure of sharing the Dharma. In those moments, as I walked back to work, I would try to appreciate my own kindness in giving my time and energy in this way. Even to say this now seems risky, as though people will think I'm prideful, but that's not at all the point. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, this isn't a long section, but, um, th this, I particularly like this idea of when the Buddha, the Buddha's instruction around this. And, and I was talking about this recently about how he said that you, we can take pleasure three, there's three moments of pleasure in a skillful action. The moment of knowing we are going to do it feels good, I'm going to do this good thing. The moment of doing it and the moment of recollecting that we've done it. And, and so th this is like a typical of the Buddhist teachings about the, which are, you know, really about intentionality, right? Mindfulness requires this intentionality. We can, we can all pay attention and we all do pay attention a certain amount of the time. But when we realize, oh, there's some benefit to be gotten out of just paying attention to everything as much as I can. Oh, well then I'm gonna try to do it more. So then we find there's benefit to be derived from being aware of when I feel good or specifically being aware of when I feel like I did kind of a good thing. Um, you know, it's one of the things we, we talk about at the end of a retreat that when you're offering Donna to really be aware in that moment of the wholesome quality, the positive quality uh, of what you're doing and to enjoy it, to take pleasure in it. Cause there can be sort of this thing of like, Oh, uh, here I'm giving Donna, let me put it in the basket. Like, Oh, it's just like a tip or it's just, you know, it's no big thing, but, we can make it into a big thing, a positive big thing, like, oh, this is good. I feel good about this. I'm helping. This is going to go towards supporting my teacher, or this is going to go towards supporting this monastery, this center. You know, this is great. I'm expressing, I'm, this action is an expression of my deepest intention, my deepest longing in the world. And and so to to, to really the opposite of trivializing, right? Whatever that is, like to really magnify these positive things. It feels good, right? And, and, and again, I think in our culture, we're, we're almost discouraged from taking pleasure in that because there's this assumption that somehow there's ego or as I say, pride in it. But, you know, there, there's a difference between pride that's driven by ego, like thinking, I am a special, unique person who's, it, it, pride is like a comparing quality, right? I'm better than these other people. I'm the special person. They are lesser than me. Whereas just this wholesome quality, taking joy in it is just experiencing it as it is. There isn't any comparing, right? It's, there's no duality and it. it's just the singular experience. This is pleasant. This is positive, you know? 
Um, and, and there again, we see kind of that there's a doorway there into a way of reflecting on all our experience because what we because this is again a door into seeing self and non-self that when we are just enjoying something that there isn't self in it right there's this that's not a self as soon as the self comes in then there's pride or there's judgment and there's comparing but when we're just taking joy in it there's no self in it and, and that's anytime we can sort of discover what it means to not be selfing, to not be um, relating from a place of I and you, self and other, but to be having a pure experience. Anytime we can do that, we're getting a taste of anatta, of not self, that, that is really the doorway. That's the, that's the key to to awakening to spiritual awakening to enlightenment you know i'm thinking about the end of the the metta sutta where it says uh, by not clinging to um it's hard like hard for me to pull it out of context um the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. And that line, is not born again into this world, is the ego being born. So, the, the and, it, and it's meant to describe the moment of awakening, when, when we're not birthing self. So this is where I think the the challenge for us around positive inventory comes uh, and positive, this whole like work around positive energy and everything, because as soon as there's either pride or, uh, or self-judgment, like something positive or negative, then self is coming in and the whole the whole experience becomes corrupted it's no longer a pure experience of giving of generosity or an act of kindness or uh, a, um, you know any other kind of skillful act now it's oh i am doing something for them and, or or i did something stupid and that and you know everybody knows that i'm I'm bad or I'm less than. And, and that, so with the, you know, that's the problem with regular inventory that it turns into a self thing. That's what's painful about it. And what, what I'm always kind of trying to point people away from is like looking at inventory as this very generic thing, like, Oh, human beings do these things. Here's the, here's the things that this human being did that need to be addressed and need to be changed and let go of. You know, I need to learn from and grow from and change. Uh, because, you know, you go down any list of behaviors that any one of us did, and you can't find any that you're the only person in the world who ever did it, you know? It's like, it's nothing personal. It doesn't belong to you. It ain't yours, you know? And, and so that, but I mean, that's hard to let go of, but it's equally hard to kind of let go of, oh, well, I am pretty good at, you know, this, I'm really, that I'm really nice. I'm, you know, uh, you know, the, the positive th things. Wow. Cause nothing good that we've ever done is unique either. You know, I mean, maybe the Buddha's enlightenment, it's pretty unique, although it's interesting you hear, when the Buddha, you know, the Buddha talks about, there were all these previous Buddhas. So he even says that what he has realized is not something unique. He, he has this metaphor of like, there's a, an ancient uh, city that, you know, that, um, 
it's like a I think of it was like an archaeological thing. But anyway, he he the path to this city has been overgrown and nobody can get to it anymore. And he simply has cleared the path for people to get to this ancient city. So it's like a it's an ancient wisdom, you know, it's enlightenment, awakening is something that's always been there. And it, and in the Buddhist cosmology, there are Buddhas that are that arise in each age, and and you know that cosmology is sort of, sort of. It seems to if you look at it, if you try to figure out the time of it, it's like must take hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years. Now I don't know if that's true. Uh, we don't have any evidence of that, but the the point is that the Buddha doesn't claim to be unique. You know, he claims to be one of a select group of special people, you know, but not unique, you know, that there have been others and that there will be another one that, you know, that they say the next, the next uh, Buddha, um, Maitreya, uh, although Thich Nhat Hanh says the next Buddha will be the Sangha. So that's a whole other, you know, journey with that one. <coughs> Um, so, so this is, I think the work we have to do around, uh, around this inventory that, it, it, you know, at the heart of it, both positive and negative is self and ego and how we deal with that. Um, so I think I'll leave it there for now and open it up for a few minutes to see if there are any other thoughts or questions. Comparison is a thief of joy. That's nice. Where does that come from, Dana? I don't know. Roosevelt or Twain. Okay. Not sure. Right. One of the, one of those quote quote machines. Yeah. You know. Yes. Exactly. We'll never know because the internet has destroyed the past. It's just everything is blurred together. Maybe the Buddha said it, you know, in some internet post. <laughs> And there's always Lincoln or Einstein or uh, somebody today was quoting Whitman. I was like, are you sure? Isn't that Mark Twain? It's like, never mind. Yeah. Who's out there anyway? Bunch of people hiding out. Hi, Kevin. This is uh, this is Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Um, I'm sorry you can't see me, and my internet uh, doesn't allow me to have video and audio on at the same time. I uh, I just wanted to make a quick um, observation that helps me sort of get into the joy of the meditation, and that's to smile. Uh -huh. the, the yeah. Smiling aisles and eyes and smiling lips. Uh, Whenever I'm having a difficult time, I that just seems to do the trick for me. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Uh, I was actually in preparing for class. I was reading some of Lee Brasington's book about the jhanas, and that's how he suggests people get into the jhanas. So, just FYI, but. Uh, uh, that only, you know, it, in the jhanas, I have to warn you, that's like, that only works when you've attained access concentration, which you're not going to do in 20 minutes. But anyway, um, so the, one of the practices that I often teach is uh, the one from uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, which, uh, and I haven't been teaching it lately, uh, but it's the got called gatas. And there, the phrases uh, are, the, you do five sets of phrases as you breathe. And the fourth one is smile, release. Um, and, and I learned that practice uh, a little over 30 years ago. It was back in the 80s, late 80s. And that had a big impact on my practice. And I'll actually, I'll read a little bit of what, about what uh, Lee says about it, because um, it's 
what he says about it is kind of what I would say about it. So it's like, might as well take it from someone else. Um, okay. Says, uh, it says, um, da, 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 da. so uh, look at most any statue of the Buddha. He has a faint smile on his face. That is not just for artistic purposes. It is there for teaching purposes. Smile when you meditate, because once you reach access concentration, which well, I guess we'll have to have a session on what that is, but not right now. Once you reach access concentration, you only have to shift your attention one inch to find a pleasant sensation, one inch from your breath to your uh, lips. And he says, now, when I tell you smile when you meditate, your reaction might be, I don't feel like smiling when I meditate. I know this because when they told me to smile when I meditated, my reaction was, I don't feel like smiling. Okay, so you don't feel like smiling. Nonetheless, if you put a fake smile on your face when you start meditating and keep putting it back on, if it falls off, on, if it falls off, okay, by the time you arrive at access concentration, the smile will feel genuine. And, he's, and then he goes further. He says, um, uh, too many people in this culture have been told, smile, whether you feel like it or not. <laughs> Hi, ladies. Uh, and maybe your reaction is, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay. If you don't smile when you meditate, you'll find some other pleasant sensation, because this is about finding a pleasant sensation, uh, which is a good point. Uh, and, and it's, you know, I was talking about this kind of in the introduction uh, I, I, in different terms. I wasn't calling it a pleasant sensation. I was just talking about it as energy. But the energy I guess I'm talking about is kind of pleasant. <laughs> so... Anyway, the, the reason I read that is because I want to acknowledge that for some people, it's just not like doable to smile. And, and you would think that I would be one of those people, actually. But it turned out that I was, I just did it, you know, when I, when I was taught this practice. You know, it was coming from Thich Nhat Hanh, and it was like, you know, I was just meditating. I wasn't like, you know, taking a picture like that's when it's really hard to smile but i'm just and it wasn't like i had to go like this you know it's just you know turn up the corner uh, when i'm smiling when i'm meditating i might not even look like i'm smiling but i it feels like i'm smiling uh i've actually peaked i think a couple times on on, on zoom and it looked like i was grimacing right so uh but it's a smile so you know Faces are weird things. Uh, anyway, um, where have I gone wrong? Uh, so, so do try smiling um, if you like, if that's workable. <laughs> and, uh, you know, see if some pleasant sensation comes that you can kind of radiate through your body. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, we are, uh, thank you, Angela, for posting all the info. So Abigail says it was Teddy Roosevelt, so not, not Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, so here's information on offering Donna, but particularly, you know, we've got uh, this retreat coming up. I know some of you are registered for it. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're going to do it. It's going to be, it's the Vajrapani retreat. Uh, it'll be similar, but not the same as the retreat uh, in in the South, you know. Here, here we'll be on the West Coast, West Coast time. And uh, nobody will have a Southern accent, so that'll be that. Uh, unless maybe somebody will. Um, and that's starting on the 29th, which isn't far away. Today is the 18th, right? I think it's the 18th. So, um, 
Uh, I'll also mention, because Jeffrey he always wants me to mention, I'm going to be uh, performing uh, music at the Soberfest DLE. Uh, do you have that anywhere, Angela? It's, and it's just going to be online. And Fordham, who's here lurking in his usual iPhone, there he is. Hello. Uh, hello. Hello. I, I've written a song for them. Hey, I've wonderful. Written, yeah, because I, I, I'm tired of, you know how you get tired of your old material? <laughs> something new, something fresh. A lot yeah, so, and, and I've been wanting to, you know, it's hard to write a song when you're old because, um, because most songs are about like falling in love when you're like a teenager. And so, uh, and, you know, and then if you get like, if it's too spiritual or too political, you know, it can get heavy handed. So this is actually a political song, but it's written in very personal terms. And, and, uh, and I, I, you know, as usual, I don't know if it's any good, but. Uh, oh, excellent. I'm looking forward to it, man. That's yeah. A, next Saturday night. Is it Saturday? I thought it was Sunday. I think it's next Saturday night. Saturday. Angela's shaking her head. What is it, Angela? It's Saturday. Saturday. Oh, good thing you told me, because I would have been a day late. <laughs> I'd be like, I'm logging on. Where is everybody? Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, um, I'm sort of excited to play it. I, I, I don't know if there's other artists out there who feel this way. I know different artists feel differently about their work. But when I first create something, I fall in love with it. And then after a while, I fall out of love with it. You know? Yeah. I think, you know, Elton John, who's in recovery many years, he talked about that too. He's a wonderful experience writing with uh, Bernie and creating these songs. And then the real struggle was going out on the road and trying to perform them and regain that energy, like you're talking yeah. about yeah. this evening, it's like refinding that energy that came up sort of naturally yeah. and recreating it for other people. Yeah. But, yeah, it'll be fun, man. I, I think it's uh, National Recovery Month. Too, oh, that's so right. It is. That's right. National Recovery Month. Yeah. Uh, my friend Barry in, in Dublin is always posting about that. I'll try. I'll try, put this link onto my website, too. I'll try to anyway. Thank you, uh, everybody. for. Thank you, Angela, for putting that up. Yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, oh, wait. Okay. Okay, wait. What? Rocked. Oh, so it's it's just on Facebook, huh? That's kind yeah, of it's on, there's a um, link to Facebook, and then this is to the website, which I think they're streaming on Facebook Live and on YouTube. Yep, and yeah. then I think one of the local Marin County. Yes, uh, Marin TV. Yep. Marin TV. That's wow. That's wild. <laughs> Hippie Vision. Okay, I see. Uh, it's got like, but it's got like several different things different dates for different th events, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I actually went um, last night. It was oh. it was pretty cool. Really? Yeah, I did. well, I'm helping. Yeah. <laughs> are you just, <laughs> are they paying you to say that? Is this like a paid advertisement? Or... No, but uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah, people in recovery doing their art and being creative and yeah. Yeah, there's one tomorrow night, I think too. Mark Karen yeah. is the draw tomorrow night. He was a guy who played with Bob Weir for years, but uh, oh, Saturday wow. night, Kevin, next Saturday night, man. That's right, tomorrow too. I, I didn't play with Bob Weir, so I included him in a, in a novel I wrote once, but anyway, let's not go there. Okay, according to my computer, it's 8.04. And now we could wait another minute and then we could do the uh, Moby Grape song 8.05, but I think uh, so. One of my favorite songs, look it up. Um, so, so we've begun positive inventory. We're all gonna be so happy over the coming weeks. So I hope, I hope this will be beneficial for people. Uh, in the meanwhile, survive. <laughs> that's, my, that's my blessing, survive emotionally, mentally, God bless RBG and may she be reborn in a better place, in a better country. Thanks. Good night.
Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you all. Good night.